We are going to be looking today at Psalm 98 in our series about the King. The title of this sermon is Rejoice, the Lord is King. So if you would follow along as I read. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Or some translations say his right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. Verse 2, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. This is a majestic psalm, if ever there was one. This is a psalm that calls us to recognize God as divine king, the king of the universe, the universal king who has brought salvation, who has worked deliverance, revealed his righteousness, shown his steadfast love, and demonstrated his faithfulness. That's all there in the first three verses. It's a majestic psalm. And then it calls us, God's people, to acknowledge what he's done by rejoicing and singing and shouting and using everything at our disposal, both vocal and instrumental, to give witness to the fact that this is indeed the divine king. But not only God's people, all creation is summoned to join in the celebration the sea and everything in it, the rivers, the hills. They roar, they clap, they sing because this divine king is coming. He's coming. He's going to make an appearance. He's coming to judge the world. He's going to judge the peoples of the world with truth, with equity, with righteousness. And that sums up the final words of the psalm. It is indeed a majestic psalm about a majestic God, God who is king. You know, talk about a positive tone. And it's all true. It can't be denied. The psalm is so exultant, so upbeat that whoever wrote this psalm, and we don't know who it is, he must have been the happiest, most optimistic, most exuberant soul there ever was. So if we asked him, how are you doing? He'd say, great and getting better every day. You ever met anybody like that? Always upbeat positivity is their middle name. So let me ask you, how are you doing today? Is that the way it is for you? Are you exultant? Are you exuberant? Are you doing great and getting better every day? Are you filled with joy and exuberance over the mighty acts of God? Well, sort of. But is not this psalm true in all its states? Yeah. Well, then what's the problem? Well, I guess I'm just not a very good Christian. And you know, if I compare myself with the tone of this psalm, I think that's how I describe myself. I guess I'm just not a very good Christian. But let's, let's stop for a moment here. Let's pretend that we're dyslectic. 
for a moment, and that instead of reading Psalm 98, we read Psalm 89. Now, it's a longer psalm, so I'll just summarize it by reading some portions of it. It starts off cheerfully enough. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. You've said, I made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. You see, God wanted to express his kingship and rule through a human king of his choosing. So God made a covenant with David, King David, and promised him that his sons would reign on the throne in Jerusalem forever. Read about it in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It sounds great. And David was, we know, the greatest king that Israel ever had. He was the king who fought Israel's battles. He protected Israel. He extended her borders, brought her a glory she had not known. And David was a worshiper of God. And true, though he failed and sinned in some significant ways, he always humbly repented and showed that he was truly a man after God's own heart. David wrote about half of the Psalms. So God's promise to him was true. And Psalm 89 goes on about God's faithfulness. And the psalmist says about God, I will not violate my covenant. I will not lie to David. His offspring will endure forever. His throne, as long as the sun before me, it shall be established forever. And that ends the first 37 verses of Psalm 89. It all sounds great, but in verse 38, there is an abrupt tone change. The psalmist has been expressing and extolling the faithfulness and the goodness of God in the strongest possible language, but in verse 38, it all changes. But now you have cast off and rejected. You're full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You've breached all his walls. You've laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. You've made all his enemies rejoice. What happened? Well, when this psalm was written, the glorious kingships of David and Solomon were just a distant memory. After those two, with few exceptions, the kings and the people of Israel and Judah steadily declined. They went downhill so profoundly and for so long that after centuries, God carried out his covenant judgment and sent them into exile. And Babylon destroyed Judah and carried her people away captive. Remember Daniel? We had that series of Daniel. Well, that's around the time frame when this psalm was written. Yet 70 years after that destruction, the Jews did return to the land of Israel, but it was never quite the same. The people were oppressed by their enemies and were struggling just to survive. So when Psalm 89 ends, the psalmist is asking these plaintive questions. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old which by your faithfulness you swore to David. Well, this is quite a different tone from Psalm 98, isn't it? As exuberant as that was, this goes just as far in the opposite direction. It's doleful. It's complaining. There's confusion. God, we don't understand what's going on have you forsaken us? That's sure what it feels like. I wonder if anybody can relate to that this morning. 
wonder if anybody feels that way. How are we supposed to understand these two songs? Had God changed? Did he break his promise? Now, we know that's not true. He was and he ever is faithful. But there's a real crisis of faith going on here. The pledge of a glorious Davidic kingdom that promised salvation and faithfulness forever did not seem to be working out. Yeah, they had returned from exile, but they were barely hanging on. Their circumstances didn't look good. Well, how about you? How about you, my friend? You are a believer. You've trusted in God. You know Jesus died for your sins. You know this, and you're truly grateful to be forgiven. But when it comes to the abundant life that Jesus promised, you know, for me personally, sometimes I do feel like I'm living in the good of it. But there have been other periods in my life, and sometimes long periods, like years worth, where it didn't look so good. those times when it's just plain hard. There are people in our church community who died this year. And they left behind grieving loved ones. Some have been sick. Some have been very sick. Others have faced financial hardships. There are others going through relational struggles some of them long-standing. And many, I'd say most, have not been able to connect with family and friends, haven't been able to get to church. And it's been hard, very hard. Not only as individuals, not only as families, but our nation with the blessings and the freedoms that we so easily take for granted our nation is being shaken today like nothing I've seen since the 60s. Things don't look very good, folks. And it's not likely to get better. So where's God in all this? Well, that's what the guy in Psalm 89 wanted to know. I'd like to try to answer that question. But you'll have to bear with me for a moment as I try to explain a little bit of how, how the, the book of Psalms came together and became a part of our canon of Scripture, because that can actually help us here. You know, the individual Psalms, there are 150 of them, were written over a long period of time, possibly over the period of a thousand years. But they were collected together and put together in what we have now as the book of Psalms in what's called the post-exilic period, after the exile, when the Jews came back from Babylon. And that's the period of time maybe in the 4th century, the 400s B.C., a few centuries before Christ. That's when the book of Psalms came together as a whole. Now, Psalm 89 closed with those haunting questions we just read. How long, O Lord? Where is your steadfast love? That's Psalm 89. It ends on that note. But Psalm 90 begins a new section in the book of Psalms that provides answers for those questions. And the grouping of Psalms that follows, roughly from about 90 to 100, are called the divine kingship Psalms. They all share a common thing that the Lord is king. And so the point that's made in these psalms is that God's people must live with faith that God is indeed king, even in the midst of circumstances that seem to deny it. Let me say that again. God's people must live with faith that God indeed is king even in the midst of circumstances that seem to deny it. The very statement that the Lord is king should be seen in juxtaposition to the human king, David. 
All human kings leave us short of the ideal, don't we? Well, we don't put our hope in an earthly king. That's what's being said. An earthly king is only a man. We put our hope in the Lord, who is the true and the righteous king. As amazing as King David was, and he was amazing, it's the divine king that we're supposed to believe in, that we're supposed to hope in, that we're supposed to trust in, and that we're supposed to look to. So, uh, the very first point today, rejoice, the king is Lord, or rejoice, the Lord is king. You know, that simple statement was the inspiration for a wonderful hymn by Charles Wesley, rejoice, the Lord is king, our king and God adore, rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Another hymn by Robert Grant, inspired by this truth that the Lord is the divine King. But we need to talk a little bit about kings before we go any further because we have a problem. We don't have kings today. I can't think of any kings. I can think of the queen, but I can't think of any kings today. So what do we know about kings? And because I'm a stream of consciousness type guy, I just sit and I hop into my stream, and this is where it takes, come along with me if you want to, and I think about kings, kings, okay, king. Hmm. Well, there was old King Cole, he was a merry old soul. Merry old soul was he. What did he do? He called for his pipe, called for his bowl, called for his fiddler's three. So I guess kings are merry old souls like merry old England, right? They smoke pipes, drink out of bowls, like violin music. Well, that's kind of silly. Well, see, thinking about silly, speaking of silly, let's, let's talk about the Burger King. You know who that is? That is a truly plastic king with a plastic smile affixed to his face that doesn't change. Maybe it's because he's about to eat a plastic whopper. I don't know. This is what we know about kings, right? This is the common popular cult. This is kings. Okay. And then if you really want to get serious, I think of, well, there was King Henry VIII. He had a lot of wives. Killed most of them. So, okay, what's my point? Today, kings are a joke. The king is a joke in our culture. But in the ancient world, kings were no joke. In the ancient world, the king in his realm had absolute authority. First of all, the king was a military commander. And if he wasn't, that kingdom didn't last. The first thing that the king did was, as commander-in-chief, fight his nation's battles. And he defeated enemies because in the ancient world, your village could at any time be overrun by marauding hordes who would rape and pillage and, if you were lucky, take you as a slave. So the first job of the king was to be mighty, have power, and have military success. He would be a warrior king. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly the imagery that we have of God in the Bible as the warrior king. But ancient kings, besides having strength and military force, also had to have wisdom because the king was not only the king, but he was the top judge in the land. He was the final court of appeals. All his laws and edicts had to be followed. And of course, if he was a good king, he would have just laws. So he had to have wisdom in knowing those laws and in carrying them out. You know, just think of Solomon, for example. Solomon had that situation that was brought to him. There were two women, each who had a baby, but one of the babies died, and both of them claimed the living baby for herself. So what did Solomon do? He took the living baby, he asked for a sword, and he said he would cut the child in two and give half to each. The real mother protested loudly and was thus identified, and Solomon's wisdom went everywhere. 
But notice what he did. He took a sword, and he was about to use it. And he could do that because he was king. The king was the judge and could carry out summary judgment on the spot, life and death. The king was no joke. Well, God is a king. He is powerful. He's also good. He's kind. He saves and delivers his people. He rescues them. He protects them. They trust in him, but he is to be feared. He is to be honored. And in the book of Psalms, which makes use of imagery, king is the image that is most often used to describe God. King. And by the way, the second most used image to describe God is refuge which is closely related. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, because as a king, God can protect us. Well, God's people need to know that he's king, even when circumstances in their lives would tell them otherwise. So let's go back to Psalm 98 and the very first verse. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he's done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Sing to the Lord a new song. That term, new song, is a technical term. It's a term for a victory song. And it's used with regard to the victories of the Lord. It's also used to talk about the wonders of God. His marvelous acts, as in Psalm 106, verse 7, when it refers to God's acts at the Red Sea. You remember the Red Sea? Though this psalm is not specific as to the wondrous works it's talking about, it's not specific, but we should have in mind the wonderful saving works of God like the Red Sea experience. That was the most dramatic event in the Old Testament. You remember, at the last minute, at the last second, with the Egyptians bearing down on them, God miraculously parted the Red Sea as the children of Israel walked through on foot. And then when the Egyptians tried to follow them, the sea closed in over them and destroyed them. That was Exodus 14. And do you know what Exodus 15 is? It's a new song. It's a victory song. Exodus 15 is the song of Moses. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he's thrown into the sea. The Lord my God is my strength and song. He also has become my victory. Moses and Miriam led the people of Israel in singing this victory song. It's kind of, kind of like an end zone dance, I guess. It was declaring what God had done. It was a new song. So here's the point of Psalm 98 in the first three verses. God has a right hand and a holy arm. He's powerful. And we should take time to recall the saving acts of God. Because when we do, a wonderful thing happens. We lift our eyes above our present circumstances and we see that God really is in charge of everything and he can work his sovereign will. Because the things that dog our steps, the troubles, which are real, are not the final word, and we see that God is mighty. And if he saved then, he could save now. Of course, we should always keep in mind the most glorious of all God's acts, and that was the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should always look back to the cross and remind ourselves daily that because of what Jesus did, living a holy life and dying a sacrificial substitutionary death, he, through his work, took our sins upon himself. And when he rose from the dead, our justification was complete from God's part. And now pronouncing us or declaring us because of our faith in that cross work to be righteous in his sight, our greatest problem has been solved. 
So it is not incorrect to say that though we may face difficulties in the moment, and we do, our long-term prospects are excellent. But it's only by reminding ourselves of the great saving works of God and praising Him for it that we can lift our hearts above the muck of this world. I mean, these are the things that God's done for you. Now, that's on a grand cosmic stage, and, 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 and the whole world uh, can see this. But I think there's another level of the wonderful works of God, and that's what He's done in your own life. The things that God has done for you. His salvation of you. His forgiveness of you. Even down to the little things that He does. Like giving you your next breath, food to eat, shelter, friends, family. All the blessings that He pours out on you. Do you stop and do you thank Him? You should. Because I fear that many of us, it can certainly happen to me, have this attitude. Well, yeah, but what have you done for me lately? That's the kind of attitude I had when I was a teenager. Expecting parents to do for me. Very upset when they didn't do what I wanted them to do. Do you have that kind of attitude? Jesus healed ten lepers. Only one of them returned to give thanks. It's just fallen human nature, I guess, that we expect to be blessed. And when we're not, we become very offended. But if we stop and think about the things that God has done for us, this is why I appreciated what Todd said in the beginning as we started this morning, to resist the hurry. It's not easy to do. To stop. To reflect. And to say thank you God. For specific things. And when we do that. And again these first verses of Psalm 98. They don't get specific. But they're assuming that we do. When we take time for reflection on the goodness and kindness of God. Then will be like that one leper who returned and gave thanks to Jesus. Take time to reflect and rejoice because the Lord is king. But again, I say, it doesn't look like he's king. Number two, we read this point of view in Psalm 89. We need to think about it a little bit more here. This, this psalmist says, God, I know you made a covenant and I know you have been faithful. But what I'm seeing does not look like covenant faithfulness. What's going on? I'm struggling. And so I don't want to just pass this over and say, hey, stop struggling, cheer up. No, no, let's talk about this a little bit. Because if you are a Christian and you've never felt this way, you just wait. You will. Life in a fallen world will take its toll on even the most optimistic of us. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. Now he did go on right after that to say, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But do you know when Jesus said that? He said that a few hours before he was crucified. So he speaks as one who knows what it is to suffer. But he was also anticipating the resurrection. There is a great danger that we can fall into, and that is of evaluating the faithfulness of God solely in terms of of our own present circumstances. Let me say that again. The great danger is in evaluating the faithfulness of God only in terms of our present experiences. So when things are going well, God is good. When things are going poorly, God's not doing his job. He's not being faithful. We have to stop and, and think, well, wait a minute now. We learned in our study of 1 Peter 
last, uh, well, it was this year, that God proves the genuineness of our faith when we trust in him, even when it hurts, through our trials. That proves the genuineness of our faith which is in the sight of God more precious than gold that perishes. This is God's way of refining our faith. As gold or silver are refined in a fire, the gold and silver are melted by heat, and then what rises to the surface is called dross, and it's skimmed off, and it's only through the fires of affliction Peter said, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as if some strange thing had happened to you. This is life in a fallen world. The fact is, we can only see the truth that God reigns, that the Lord is king, when we put on our faith glasses. It's just as if I... I put these glasses on and I can see through the eyes of faith. If I'm just looking with my natural eyes, I don't see God. I can't see Him. I can't encounter Him with my senses. He has to be spiritually discerned. And and to put on my faith glasses means that I, I, I look at Him through the lens of Scripture. And when I look at Him through the lens of Scripture, I can see that, that He exists and He's doing something here. So what we need is to be reminded that in spite of what we see around us, God is indeed the divine king. And that's what these divine kingship psalms are intended to do. This is why at the very editorial center of the book of Psalms, this beginning of book four of the Psalms, we have this grouping of songs that express this truth. And then having expressed this truth, it calls upon us to express our faith in this truth. It tells us to make a joyful noise to the Lord or to shout to the Lord, all the earth, to break forth into glorious songs, to sing praise to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre, with the horn, with the trumpet, to make a joyful noise before the King. My friends, To tell people to make a joyful noise if they haven't thought at all about the one that they're singing to, it will always come away as hollow. And that's why we really need to worship the Lord corporately. When we come together as a group and we have others leading us, it reminds us of what we're doing and why. Actually, every time we have a worship service, friends, it is a dress rehearsal for that day when the Lord returns. We are singing to a God we cannot see, but we are rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory because we believe in Him. And you are to be commended for coming and for worshiping. Go ahead and pat yourself on the back. Get a attaboy for that. Yeah, that's good. It's good. It's good when we do this. It's good when we trust God in the midst of trials. That is very pleasing to God. When we sing, when we sing from the heart, we are giving expression to a real and a living faith. And even if it's very weak, even if it's just as small as a grain of mustard seed, it's precious in his sight. But the psalm doesn't end with us making a joyful noise. More is to come. Number three, the king is coming. The final verses of this psalm Look to a future coming of the king. It says, let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, the hills sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will, future tense, judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Now the focus here begins with creation. The sea, the river, the hills, they roar, they sing, they clap before the Lord. Why? Because he's coming. Creation is excited that the Lord will return. And why is creation so excited? Because creation itself has suffered as a result of the fall. 
We have thorns and thistles because of the fall of man. And creation, just like the rest of the world and our own selves, is out of whack. Not completely, but to a large extent. But joy to the world, the king has come. Let earth receive her king because he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. The king is coming. And when the king comes, he's going to set all things to right. Now it says he's coming to judge the world and its peoples, and that is true. And that's a fearful thing for those who have resisted him and who have persistently and stubbornly continued in sin. The return of the Lord is going to be a fearful time. That's why we must evangelize while we have the opportunity because coming to judge means that the Lord is going to bring judicial judgment to evil. But the Lord coming to judge actually means more than that. And much more perhaps because to judge the Lord is going to restore. To judge means also to restore things to the way they were supposed to be. We're going to have a new heaven and a new earth restored to righteousness when the Lord returns. Just like it says in Psalm 23, He restoreth my soul. This is what God does when He comes to us. He's in the process right now of restoring our souls which are broken. And He's going to do the same thing for a broken world, a broken creation. My friends, a more glorious day is coming. The King who is coming is God the Son. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government of the kingdom is going to be on his shoulders. And he's going to have wonderful names like Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David to order and to establish it from this time forth and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to perform this. My friends, imagine a world where there is perfect justice, where there's no corruption, where there's no bullying, no corruption in government, no bullying in schools, no sin. There's only righteousness, peace, and joy. There's no sin, there's no sorrow, there's no sickness, there's no death, so there's no grieving. There's no selfishness anymore, but there's selfless serving of others. There's joy, there's love, there's peace. All are blessed, happy, and content. And at the center of it all is a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who are fully recognized for who they are, no more evolution baloney. God created it all and sustained it all. And there's no more contrary voices. The truth prevails. God is worshipped. His people are blessed. They live in a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. That is the kingdom of God that is coming. Now, it's already come in measure, but not in its fullness. And you can't see it at all unless you have your faith glasses on. But if you have those kinds of eyes, and if you repent and believe, you can enter this kingdom. If there's anybody here today who is not a citizen of the kingdom of God, who has not understood that Jesus Christ is truly Lord, and a Savior who wants to receive you. You can be a part of this kingdom. You can have Him as your Savior, as the shepherd of your soul today. All you have to do is humble yourself and repent of your sin 
and turn to him in faith and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And if you come to Christ, he will in no way reject you. I hope we're all in that state today where we belong to him. And if not, please come to Christ. Come and talk with me after the meeting. I'd be happy to pray with you. We can trust this God, this King. We can acknowledge the reality of Psalm 89. But when it comes to that question, how long, O oh Lord? The Lord would say to us, just a little longer, just a little longer, but a new day is coming and you can actually enter into the good of it right now. Will you come to him? Stand with me as we pray. Our heavenly father, you are the great and the mighty king. We thank you for a kingdom that has come with the coming of your son. And though it has not yet come in its fullness and we feel the effects of the fall within us and without us, yet we trust in you and we hope in you and we believe in you. You have saved in the past. You have sent your son. He rose from the dead and he is alive forevermore. And you have given us the gift of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we praise you and we rejoice this morning. And Lord, I pray for those that are suffering and are feeling acutely the effects of the fall today in their bodies, in their relationships. Lord, strengthen them according to your grace. Help all of us to humble ourselves under your mighty hand because we know you give grace to the humble. Give grace now, Lord, as we return to worship you. In Jesus' name.